Welcome to this episode of Monday Morning Joe. I'm Dr. Andrew Kirkendall from the Moffitt Cancer Center. Monday Morning Joe is a quick-hitting, coffee-talk-style five-episode series on the latest and greatest in advanced systemic mastocytosis with associated myeloid neoplasms. Please remember to subscribe to Exchange CME YouTube channel and make sure notifications are turned on to be prompted when new episodes are released. Today, we're going to discuss management of patients with systemic mastocytosis in an associated hematologic neoplasm or associated myeloid neoplasm. So how should therapeutic decision-making be approached for patients with SMHN or AMN? I think this is a really uh, more of an art than a science many times. I, I think there's unique challenges in systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm to decide what, what do you address first and how do you go about addressing that. This is clearly a disease state where we're talking about a dual disease state, two different things that are going on. And so oftentimes you're not able to treat both at the same time. And therefore you need to decide on which one is the most appropriate to treat first off. Oftentimes we are asking ourselves the question, which is a greater threat to the patient? Is it the AHN? or is it the systemic mastocytosis? But then we also have to factor in what treatment options do we have for either of those? And that can really be something that's important. Now, if we're thinking about the AHN uh, as being uh, the more prominent component, well, certainly we're gonna direct our therapies towards that. Oftentimes we run into this in patients that are diagnosed with systemic mastocytosis and acute myeloid leukemia, where the AML portion of the disease certainly warrants our immediate attention, and the SM component of the disease may be something that we can keep in the back of our minds. Many times, however, the SM component is the most prominent aspect of the disease, and the AHN may be something that's more low-grade, in which case we can turn our attentions and focus on the systemic mastocytosis component. So what are our available treatment options for systemic mastocytosis? Because I think that's something that needs to be taken into account when we're deciding what you know, disease state we should treat, you also have to think about what kind of treatment options you have. It may be nice to treat one aspect of the disease, but if you don't have a treatment for it, then, then really what are you opting for? So when we think about advanced SM, you know, historically we've had some standard therapies such as interferon or cladribine. You know, frequently these aren't used anymore based upon the, the emergence of some newer therapies. But, but historically this is what we had to, uh, to offer patients. Uh, interferon being something that was more mild in nature, cladribine being something that was more mild suppressive. And then with most patients with systemic mastocytosis, we're often offering anti-mediator therapies, things like antihistamines, mast cell stabilizers, leukotriene inhibitors. But now with the emergence of kit targeting therapy, we certainly have additional options to offer patients. Our first kind of uh, kit inhibitor was, was a, a drug called imatinib. Um, now, unfortunately, it seems to be uh, not something that's effective in most patients with systemic mastocytosis because patients with the D816V mutation are actually quite resistant to this. So this is still to some extent indicated in patients that have kit D816V negative systemic mastocytosis but often this is really limited to patients that have uh, different diseases called myeloid lymphoid neoplasms with eosinophilia who often exhibit FIP1L1 rearrangements or PDHFR rearrangements that are sensitive to, to imatinib. We have the approval of mitostorin, which is a, a, a more of a non-selective kit inhibitor. So it doesn't specifically or selectively target the mutated form of kit, but it does have kit inhibition properties. And in a phase two trial was shown to be quite effective in improving uh, mast cell burden in advanced systemic mastocytosis patients. And then more recently, we have the approval of avapritinib, which is a more selective, high affinity uh, inhibitor of the D816V mutation that's approved for adult patients with advanced systemic mastocytosis, but not recommended for patients who have platelets that are less than 50. So in a patient with advanced systemic mastocytosis and a kit mutation, how do you decide between mitostorin and avapritinib? You know, I think that this is a challenge because they haven't really been compared head to head. Mitostorin was certainly approved before avapritinib, and, and there were many people on the avapritinib trial that had previously been treated with mitostorin, but certainly there was no head to head comparison. I will note that there is a quite a starkly different uh, adverse event profiles. When we think about mitostorin, we, we frequently think about GI toxicity, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which is quite frequent and likely due to its inhibition of FLT3. Some of these side effects can be mitigated with, with prophylactic antiemetics and antidiarrheals, as we do with many of our, our drugs that do have GI toxicity. When we think about avapritinib, certainly less GI toxicity here, but more incidence of, uh, or higher incidence of periorbital edema, which is due to PDGFR inhibition. Uh, and there's also been associated with an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Now, this is typically seen at higher doses, uh, this was seen uh, at, when, at even higher doses than are approved for systemic mastocytosis on, based upon the, the trials done for GIST tumors. But then this was also seen in the systemic mastocytosis trials, but typically reserved for those patients that had very low platelet counts. And so this is why 
it's not recommended to give avapritinib to patients with less than 50,000 platelets. As far as mitigation effects or, 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 or methods to mitigate this, certainly uh, select your patients for having platelets greater than 50,000 and then monitor platelets closely. And if the platelets do drop below 50, consider dose reductions, platelet transfusions, platelet support, and certainly holding the medication until the platelets come up to a more appropriate level. The last AE I would mention is, is the potential for cognitive adverse events seen in around 10 to 15% of patients on the trial. And this could be something different than intracranial hemorrhages. This is something that's more associated with maybe forgetting where keys are, forgetting directions, confusion that's a, a bit different than baseline. This can range from quite mild in nature to to even sometimes a bit more concerning. And, and this is something that, that while mostly mild and tolerable, it's something that we really need to keep an eye out for and something that we counsel patients on, talk to them. And certainly this is where we start to incorporate and involve patients and their loved ones to truly get an understanding of what their baseline cognitive function is and really clue us in when there's any abnormalities there because this is something we want, we want to act on in a very timely manner. So let's delve into some of the clinical trial data for some of these agents. So we look at the mitostorin phase two study that I uh, previously alluded to. This was an open label study of mitostorin at 100 milligrams twice daily. Now this is double the dose that we use in patients with FLT3 AML where we dose those patients with 50 milligrams twice daily. In this trial, there were 116 patients with advanced SM. 57 of those uh, had systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm. Here we showed an overall response rate in these patients of 60%, 45% of which had a, a major response, meaning complete resolution of a C finding or one, at least one type of mastocytosis related organ damage. The median overall survival was still quite modest, 28.7 months. And we know that over half of the patients on this trial experienced dose reductions due to adverse events, although re-escalation to the starting dose was feasible in about a third of those patients. On 10-year follow-up of this trial, uh, in, a, in a subset, 26 patients, we can see the overall response rate remained around 69% and the median overall survival for the entire cohort of patients was 40 months. Now, when we look at avapritinib, we could look at first at the EXPLORER trial. Now, this trial did exclude patients that had acute myeloid leukemia or very high-risk MDS. You know, those would be diseases where really the focus should be on those associated hematologic neoplasms. 13% of patients experienced intracranial bleeding that was strongly associated with low platelets. This was often found during routine surveillance exams, and many times this was not symptomatic. But this led to the exclusion of patients who had platelet counts less than 50,000 from the Pathfinder study. Now, there remains a concern for cognitive impairments associated with avapritinib, as I previously alluded to. On the Pathfinder study, the overall response rate was similar at 74%, and this was enrolled uh, involving patients that had advanced systemic mastocytosis, the majority of which, 70%, had SMAHN. Again, this trial excluded patients that had AML or high risk, very high risk MDS, where we think that those diseases really warrant the focus of treatment, and it excluded patients who had platelets less than 50,000. Now, what are some emerging therapies that, to watch for, and, and what treatment gaps might these fill? So we have a few agents that are getting uh, further developed, such as beziclastinib, uh, repretinib or elanestinib, otherwise known as blue 263. Many times these are these are these are all uh, focused on on inhibiting KIT and KIT D816V, especially in the setting of bezoclastinib and and elastinib. Really, where where do we think these these could play a role? And I would say first, just think about the adverse effects we see with avapritinib and mitostorin. I certainly think that, that potentially these agents may be able to, to deliver uh, potent kit inhibition without uh, the same degree of neurotoxicity or bleeding risk and may also be able to uh, do so with less uh, edema or swelling. And so that's really the focus is whether or not these agents can be appropriately leveraged with less adverse events than we see with our currently available agents. So how do I know once I start one of these kit inhibitors that we're responding? And so I think um, certainly uh, it's challenging to apply our treatment response criteria in patients that have dual disease States because we may not know um, exactly what to, what part of the disease is responding and what part of the disease continues to go from due to the, the concomitant disease state. And so one of the response criteria that's recently been proposed is something called the pure pathologic response. And this is really something that really focuses specifically on mast cell burden and monitors the D816V allele burden as well as tryptase levels to really focus in on the response in the mast cell lineage of the disease. So what take-home points do we have? Uh, so historical therapies such as cladribine and interferon are largely being replaced by kit inhibitors. Mitostorin and avapritinib are approved for the treatment of advanced SM, and both are very potent uh, inhibitors of kit, albeit with different selectivity for the mutated form of the protein. 
and mitostorin and avaprinib have not been compared head to head. However, they do have widely different, uh, differentiating uh, toxicity profiles. Thank you for joining me today. As discussed earlier, please check back for new episodes on the Exchange CME YouTube page. Clinicians, nurses, and pharmacists can also visit exchangecme.com for free access to CME in a variety of therapeutic areas. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode of Monday Morning Joe.